We should probably point out that this is not universal, that everybody's diet is going to affect them differently. Oh, Some for people sure. are fine with carbohydrates. Yeah. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. out there <clears throat> that eat a high carbohydrate diet and they have zero issues with it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's one of the weirder things about people. You know, yeah. it's it, that we are so variable depending mm -hmm. upon your ancestry, you know, what part of the world they, they evolved. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to me because I mean, I'll look at folks doing complete opposite of who I am and they're, they're doing just fine. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, then I'll look at some folks too that are doing the opposite of me and they're doing just fine for a while. And then they ultimately start noticing the same kind of things I did and then they can clean it up. Uh, so it is kind of, yeah, I think at the end of the day, you just got to be kind of honest with yourself. And, you know, some people I think are, really really robust <laughs> and they can they can hit their body with that high octane fuel carbohydrate like day in and day out at a high level and it doesn't seem to bother them much but mm. you know other people like yet think just that it can kind of it's like playing with rocket fuel a little bit where you know a little bit can be great and too much of it can kind of burn you up a little bit so you're saying that you started off at like 50 grams of carbohydrates a day like real strict ketosis diet mm -hmm. what, did, what did you eventually move to um, it, so the way I call it is I periodize it. So like when I look at my year, you're, you can pick out a week where I'm kind of in peak training and then pick out a week where I'm kind of in like a recovery phase or off season. And it looks like two completely different lifestyles. So my first thought after kind of like working through the whole ketogenic approach, um, cause I should add to like, um, once I got like feeling good about that, I started adding back speed workouts and things like that. And I definitely noticed that I was missing kind of that last year. Like mm. it, it was a lot more difficult to go out and really throttle down. Like I could run all day at a slow pace, but if I decided to go out on the track and do like 400 meter repeats at like a really fast, like a really fast pace, um, it was really hard to kind of to be able to do that. That's a common complaint. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rob Wolf, you know Rob Wolf? Yep. Mm -hmm. Rob Wolf had a similar issue. He's gotten like very heavily into jujitsu. And he was telling me that he just can't stick to that 50 grams of carbohydrates a day yeah. and still have the, the energy to go hard. Mm -hmm. does, does, do you know, does Rob Wolf work out more than one time a day? I do not know. Um, he looks very fit, though. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not sure what his uh, what his schedule is, but I know he works out very hard. And if he's doing jujitsu, this is really it's very difficult to do jujitsu any other way than hard. Sure. Yeah. You know, this is one thing I've always been curious about too. And you know, like I'm not I'm not trying to come come on here and say like everyone should switch to doing what I do. I mean, I think you should follow your own your own your own personal self. And if be honest with yourself, if you feel great, do what you're doing. If you don't, then probably look to change something. But like one thing I'm always looking at now or suspecting is that like it's more about the recovery between efforts than it is about the intensity of the effort or the duration of the effort in terms of how much carbs you need to bring back or want to bring back. Because I've also had circumstances where like I'll do like a big workout or a race or something like that and then I'll go really easy for like a week. And during that week, I'll go like super strict keto because um, I'm recovering. I'm not doing anything intense. I'm not doing anything too long. Um, so that's, that's the point of my training where I kind of say, all right, let's get rid of the start, the fast acting fuel sources. I don't need them right now and reset that whole fat adaptation thing. Um, so you feel like you, the fast acting fuel sources like carbohydrates, you only really need them when you're pushing hard, right? when you're really running fast. Yeah. And I actually think it's, it's when you're doubling down on those on a regular basis. So like if you're working out really hard for like 45 minutes to an hour a day, I think you can probably get away with almost a ketogenic or like a really low carbohydrate approach because you're giving yourself like 23 plus hours between sessions for your body to kind of restock glycogen stores from other areas like, you know, f from fat and proteins and things like that. I think when you start getting into a system where you're like myself, I'm doing two days a lot and then sometimes one of those is a speed session that's when I feel like I need to bring some of the carbohydrate back. And I think it's probably just to get some of the glycogen at a little faster rate, because that is going to replenish your glycogen stores faster as a carbohydrate than like a fat or, or a protein probably would. So how many grams of carbohydrates a day would you have on a day like that? Um, when I'm in like peak training, which is about 20 hours a week of running, strength training and mobility type stuff, you know, I'll probably let myself get up to like... 15 to 25 percent of my intake from carbohydrate um what do you know, think that is in grams uh it probably de it depends a lot on like what i actually do um because i don't count calories very often i i used to just to kind of like see what was going on and then i kind of got intuitive with it uh gram wise you know it's probably anywhere from like two to three hundred maybe and then 
when I'm in those phases of training, it's really intense in terms of like just, uh, or I shouldn't say intense. It's just really tedious in the amount of time and energy required for it. Now, are you blood monitoring at that time? Are you checking your millimolar levels? Uh, I am sometimes like when I'm, like when I get curious about that type of stuff or I've done it in the past, I've actually, what I did originally is I got the, the blood ketone monitor and I also got one of those ketonics, uh, like it, it's like this little USB thing and then you blow into it. And it, yeah. How and, is that accurate? Um, I think there's, I think there's varied results. I think they've gotten a lot better with it. Um, but what I did is I actually measured my blood ketone and then I would use that and I tried to find kind of like if mine was matching what that thing would say. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had an, I, I got it to where I kind of had an idea where certain ranges on that thing would kind of indicate whether I was in ketosis or not. Um, so like I very much is coming out of ketosis during peak training. Like when I would, especially when I would get up to two, 300 grams of carbohydrate, I would come out of ketosis uh, and I'd probably go back into ketosis throughout that, that, that phase. Um, when you say go back in and come out, uh, like what kind of a time period are you talking about? Uh, it, it, the time period was more indicative about what I kind of ate during it too. Like if I did, if, if, if I did, or I shouldn't say what I, like how I kind of structured those two to 300 grams of carbohydrate. Like if I did like a big bolus of it in one meal, I'd get back into ketosis a little quicker because then I wouldn't come back to the carbohydrates again for so a while. So would you vary in inside the day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, like I would still, like if I, and, he, and here's where it got kind of interesting, I guess, is I do a lot of my, the heaviest bulk of my training in the morning. So I typically wake up and have some like coffee with like coconut milk or heavy whipping cream or something like that. And then, uh, you know, go for my run. So then when I get back from a run, you know, it might be two hours, sometimes even three. And, uh, you know, at that point I had just slept for eight to 10 hours. Then, you know, by the time I got done with my run, you know, I hadn't, I had probably hadn't eat. I had essentially done like a small intermittent fast for the most part. Um, so like even when I had the higher amounts of carbohydrates, I'd find myself going back into ketosis at the end of something like that sometimes. Um, but really it was, to me, it wasn't necessarily a question of whether I was in ketosis or not because that really wasn't important to me. Um, like, Performance is important. Exactly, yeah. And what I wanted out of this approach was um, I wanted to be able to rely on my body to, body to burn high levels of fat when I needed it to, but I also wanted to be metabolically flexible enough where if I needed to hit the gas pedal, I could do that as well. Um, and I think that's where people get a little uh, uh, confused or up in arms or something because there's not a whole lot of studies that kind of look at that specifically. Like, can you do that or can you not do that? Some people think it's kind of an all or nothing thing where you either get really fat adapted or you get really carb dependent and then everything else is kind of like, you know, this gray area that you can't really get into. But that's not my experience. You know, my experience has been that like I can get, look here, here's my kind of litmus test. If I can go out for like a four hour or even five hour run with no fuel other than water and electrolytes, then I'm fat adapted enough. I don't need to get any more fat adapted than that because I can eat during a race and everyone else is going to be. So like, I don't really need to get more fat adapted that from a performance standpoint. Um, so when I get to that point, then it's like, how many, how many carbohydrates can I bring back to kind of give me that extra nudge or that extra fuel substrate? Um, Have and, you ever tried mixing exogenous ketones with carbohydrates? Um, because not Greenfield was talking about that and he yeah. said it's like doing steroids. <laughs> he said it was incredible. Yeah, there's, but again, he's he's a maniac. He's a maniac. Yeah. yeah. There's a who else was it? Was it Dominic Diagostino was playing around with that stuff quite a bit too? Or he might have helped. Uh, he might have helped uh, with the the creation of some of that stuff. I know there was. Uh, I'd have to look back in my emails and stuff. But I, I actually had uh, there was a guy who was doing a real clinical version of the exogenous ketones, and um, he had sent me one a while back to kind of do a little test for him. And uh, it, it was like just this little canister of exogenous ketone. And he wanted me to kind of check my ketones when I woke up in the morning, take that, test it 15 minutes later, and then test again after my run. Was that like a ketone ester? Yeah, I think so. Like super potent stuff. Tastes yep. like Godzilla's dick. <laughs> yeah. Matt Brown brought some of that in. It's like, woof. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you test your ketones when you took it? Or? No, I didn't. I didn't have a monitor on me, but it tasted terrible, but I felt great. Yeah. After it was over. You, and you have to take it with uh, glucose. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think that's maybe that's where I messed up. But uh, um, 
besides that, like my ketone level shot up. I woke up that morning, I think I was at like 1.0 millimoles or something like that. I took that exogenous ketone um, and 15 minutes later I tested, I was at 3.7 millimoles. 